Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, so uh, just to introduce ourselves, I'm Caleb, and this is Roran. We are the chef couple of Magpie and the Tiger. Um, so uh, a little bit about us. We have a, our, a restaurant in D.C., um, in the northwest side of D.C., and recently um, we had to close. Uh, but now we are currently in the midst of a pop-up um, for this is actually the last weekend of our pop-up. And we are also doing private dinners and private events. So, um, you know, we're currently still exploring uh, what we love to do and see what we want to do next. Um, so uh, please take a look at our Instagram and um, our social media to see what we're up to because you might find us close to Okay. All right, so we're going to jump into our demo. So we have two recipes for you today. The first one is chapcha, and the second one is kokomomaka. So what ties these two together is this star ingredient right here. So, um, I'll just pick it up. So it is the Korean sweet potato. So um, a little bit different from what you typically see in your our grocery stores here in the U.S. Um, when we think sweet potato, usually we think like an orange flesh, but this one actually has a nice, like creamy colored, like uh, tan flesh. It's super delicious. It's definitely sweeter, um, a little more starchy than what you are probably used to in your typical grocery store. Um, but for any Korean kid, any Korean American kid, it's just one of those ingredients where like as soon as fall hits, um, or it starts to get chilly into the winter and all of that, like this is something that we crave. Um, our moms cook this super simply, wrap it in a little foil and uh, threw it inside of a, um, like a hot oven and it would just roast it. And basically everything gets like, all the sugars caramelized and everything. So this is one of those treats that we were just like, you know, on Saturday mornings we'd be watching our cartoons and just feeling it. Um, and it's like a great travel snack too. So anytime you're traveling in the car, you would also like it. So just super, super delicious. It is an amazing ingredient. So we're gonna kind of show it off today in two different forms. Um, so the first one that we're gonna start with uh, is called chapche. So the literal translation of chapche is mixed vegetables. Chap meaning mixed, che meaning vegetable. Um, so we just kind of are going off of uh, like a very traditional recipe, um, but in in true form to its meaning, you can kind of use whatever is in your fridge. Um, this is like a very easy weekday, weeknight um, sort of a dinner that you can put together. Uh, and traditionally, though, it is something that is used as a celebratory dish. So kind of think of graduations or you know um, any kind of like a holiday. Usually, you will see. Dish. Um, so um, the ingredient that uh, is the sweet potato is this um, sweet potato noodle. So if you look like it's very, uh, it's like a glass like uh, noodle with, uh, you can see that it's a little bit clear, kind of a gray, like opaque color. Um, that is uh, the sweet potato um, distilled down to its starch and then made into noodle. Um, so we're going to get started on preparing that. Um, so for us today, we our vegetables that we have um, are shiitake mushrooms, and then we have some carrots that we julienne. And then um, included on the rest in the recipe, it, uh, we did not include this, but again, this is one of those things where you can sort of choose um, things that you like, to eat, um, vegetables that you like to mix in and just experiment. Um, so uh, we have uh, red bell peppers and then some blanched spinach. And then, um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take each individual ingredient and we're going to um, 
saute them individually. So when you do that, you're just going to cook all the ingredients separately. So when you mix, um, mix everything together, um, everything's going to be cooked. Um, and then the sauce is going to incorporate and coat everything into the, like, into the vegetables and the noodles. So we're just going to take a pan, um, put it on a high heat just to get started and put a little bit of oil down. Um, and, you know, just based on like, just a simple saute. So we're just going to cook the vegetables um, through and that's basically it. And then um, what we're going to do is once we're done with each vegetable, we're going to deposit it into uh, like some sort of mixing bowl or a, a vessel so that we can end up like mixing everything together. Um, so I'm going to wait until the, until the oil gets heated before I get started. And while he does that, um, I'm going to try to show you guys the cut on vegetables. So all the vegetables hopefully will be roughly kind of the same size. Um, we call it a julienne, but all that really means is just like really, uh, just kind of like slice it through. You want it to be kind of like a matchstick. Um, so if you can see kind of these guys, um, like that's what we are looking at. So if you have, like this is kind of a chef trick. So if you have your vegetables um, the same size, they're usually going to cook at very similar times. So obviously like a potato is not going to cook the same time as like an onion or something. But um, that's kind of like a general rule of thumb that we like to use. Um, so just showing you. So we have taken an onion. We just peeled it and we cut it in half. So it's just like that. And then basically all you're doing is you're kind of following the round of the onion. So we're going to start here and angle our knife this way. So you're not going straight down. You're kind of following it all the way down. And then when you get here, another little trick that we like to do, it's kind of hard to balance it once you get over here. So when we get over there, we actually flip it so that we get a little bit more traction and we can um, hold it down and be safe while we cut it. So while we still wait for this to warm up, I'll show you that we're just gonna go down. That actually feels like enough. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the onion. So we're gonna start out with the onion and then um, just place it into the pan. And while we're cooking this, um, we're not looking for the vegetables to brown. So if you find that your vegetables are starting to brown, um, it means that your heat is on too high. Um, so just adjust the temperature as necessary. And again, just to reiterate, we're just going to cook this through so you can see it. Uh, Vapors in my eyes. Oh, they're so spicy. <laughs> and always be careful with onions. They <laughs> have a way of making you cry. <laughs> and while you guys are cooking the onions, can you tell us about what kind of oil you're using? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so this is also another neat little chef trick. So it's just a squeeze bottle. You can get these like pretty much anywhere. Um, super duper cheap. And we just buy uh, grapeseed oil. We really like grapeseed oil for cooking. Um, it's a very, what we like to call like a squeaky clean oil. And what that just means is that it's like process where it's just so clean, where when you cook, it's not, it has like a really high temperature that it burns, which is a great thing for us because there are things that we want to grill and there are things that we want to saute. So it can kind of handle like the whole spectrum of, uh, heat, which is really, really nice. Oh. Um, but you don't have to use this. Uh, and another thing that is. And specifically for this recipe, the reason why we're using a neutral flavored oil is that uh, we don't want to uh, influence the flavor mm -hmm. of the recipe by um, using something like olive oil. So olive oil is something that um, we use quite commonly for the flavor of it, but because olive oil has sort of a specific flavor, um, we don't want to have that in our dish. So uh, we don't recommend using that uh, when you're used for making, if you make this recipe, um, because you might find that it throws off some of the flavors in the recipe. Um, so we're at a point where 
it's starting to become translucent and it's slightly browning around the edges, which is perfectly fine. Um, but we're at a point where they're cooked all the way through. So I'm going to take that off the heat. And then I'm going to continue doing that with the remaining vegetables. And while I'm doing that, um, you know, we, I, I just want to like say like this is one of those, one of these ingredients or uh, dishes where around this time during the holidays, it is uh, one, like the dishes that we remember seeing all the time when we go to holiday parties or gatherings or um, any any sort of event. So, you know, Ron and I used to uh, go to a lot of church gatherings and um, with Korean American churches, uh, we would see a lot of food. Food was like something that would bring us all together um, and also was like a way for us to experience our own uh, culture through our food. And um, one of the biggest aspects of that, of uh, connecting with our community was through the food that we we're making. So around this time, um, around that the holiday season, we would see a lot of chapche. And, you know, right now is a perfect time, even though it's, I think it's like 50 degrees and <laughs> sunny outside. <laughs> Maybe you could just like feel a little bit more festive if you make this dish. Um, so now, you know, repeating every step, we're going to repeat it with the carrots. So the carrots are now um, just cooked through and they're a little bit floppy, which is kind of what you're looking for. Um, and you don't, you just don't want it to be crunchy or raw. Um, so we're gonna repeat that. And each time you can add some oil just to help cook it, but um, just do just enough so that you don't have like an overwhelmingly oily um, dish because at the end we are going to add a little bit of sesame oil, um, but if your vegetables are very oily um, to start with, um, you're going to find that the, the final dish will be oily and you kind of want to avoid that. Um, so, and most About of the what temperature are you all using? So we are, I'm um, shifting from a medium to medium high heat, um, depending on um, kind of how it looks. So I started at a medium high just to get the pan hot and then uh, shift to medium if I'm starting to see it brown um, faster. And it just depends on the vegetable. Um, each vegetable is gonna respond slightly differently and might cook faster or brown faster. Um, but the medium to medium high is where our range is right now. Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback off of what Kayla was talking about, um, so we just did a Thanksgiving event, um, and just to kind of describe to you like the Korean American experience, because I think that's a question that we get a lot is like, well, Mac the Tiger, is that Korean? Is it American? What even is Korean American? And like, that's a great question. That's what we're exploring. Um, I don't think there's any like real set definition of it, but um, it's just something that we are exploring because these are the things that we grew up with. So for example, like I grew up in Western New York around like a big Italian population. And so that's why I talk with my hands like this, you know, um, but I grew up with like spaghetti and meatballs, like all around me. Um, whenever I went to like friends' houses, like that's like a dish that I would be served constantly, like from their moms that like had that recipe from their uh, grandmas and everything, as well as like that would hit home for me in my heart in terms of a dish, um, just as much as like at home um, where my mom would bring out like kimchi and something like chapche. Um, and so like uh, the Korean church, like he was saying was somewhere, somewhere where we both like have experiences growing up, the Korean American church. And so kind of to give you a picture of like what that felt like for us growing up was that during Thanksgiving time, you know, we're, we, a lot of us think, you know, turkey, mashed potatoes, things like that, gravy. Um, but for us, whenever we would have like, you know, our gigantic plate of way too much food, because we have no idea how to portion things when we're small, um, uh, we would have like turkey, gravy, mashed potatoes, and right next to it, we would have kimchi, chapche, 
um, and other like Korean ingredients. So it was all on one plate and that's really like how we grew up and it was very, very normal to us. Um, so that's just kind of like some of the things that we are trying to bring into Magpie and Tiger um, because that's who we are. We are both Korean and we are American. Um, as Caleb is finishing up, so he has the mushrooms in the pan right now that he's lightly sauteing and then he's gonna go in finally with the spinach. I wanna talk to you guys about these noodles real quick. So we did cook them ahead of time just cause it takes a little bit of time to do that. Um, there's a lot of different brands out there wherever you go to your like local Asian grocery store, there's gonna be a bunch of brands you don't really have a favorite um it's just pick whatever um but there is going to be like an instruction panel on the back of it so just make sure that um for whatever type that you get just go ahead and follow the instructions on the back one trick that we like to do just because you know the noodles do come in such a huge pack and they're just like gigantic like that um just to make it a little easier to kind of like drop into your pot, we uh, we do like to soak them. And that actually can cut down your um, cooking time as well. So just make sure to monitor it. And one way that you can do that is just get like a little bowl of cold water. After you like see it's getting kind of like bouncy and like just literally think of it like cooking like pasta, like spaghetti. You're just looking for a certain texture where it's not like hard. Um, you can drop it like one noodle into the cold water and taste it just to see if it's like the nice bouncy texture. So. Um, as differently from um, like pasta that we usually uh, will eat on a weekday, weeknight, whatever, um, you're not actually looking for al dente. So al dente just means like to the tooth, which means like there's a little bit of texture. Um, that's not necessarily what you want. The sweet potato noodle is already really bouncy and chewy, um, and you want to go for that texture. But what it can do is that if you undercook it, you will get that al dente, and that's not what you want. If you overcook it as well, it's going to start to kind of just get mushy. So you want to kind of find that sweet spot, but it's a very forgiving noodle. So like, it's not going to like one second later, it's going to go to this other end. Um, so that is the noodle that has already been cooked off. So if you can see, it's like very bouncy. <laughs> so we just finished all the vegetables. Um, I'm going to show it to you guys. It's all in one pan all mixed together in one bowl and then finally we're going to introduce when you cook these noodles um we'll rinse you rinse them under cold water um just to get them uh to not stick to each other as much but inevitably um because of the nature of the noodle they start to stick to each other um you can see kind of they're sticking to each other right now so um to sort of loosen them up before you mix them, uh, we're gonna saute them in the pan and just get them to be a little bit loose. And then we're you know, sort of warm it through, add some oil so that it loosens and um, kind of spreads apart so they're not sticking to each other. And then just do your best um, because these noodles are a bit sticky. Um, and as you do that and as you loosen it, it's going to just allow the sauce that we're going to be making to mix everything together, um, be able to spread evenly along um, all the noodles and all of the vegetables. And um, I just want to show you what, what we're looking for because we're not necessarily looking for them to be completely like uh, separate, but just a little bit loosened up. Um, so that's what kind of what you're looking for. So if you um, see this, you're kind of at a good spot um, compared to just moments before where it was a lot stickier. You just kind of want to loosen it just a tad so we're going to add that to the rest of the vegetables so, yeah so now we're going to go into the sauce so this is something that you do want to have uh kind of hit the noodles when they're and the vegetables when they're warm just because it kind of helps our warm everything through and then really coat everything nicely so what we're going to start with is my favorite, one of my favorite kitchen tools. So this is um, like a small fine toothed uh, grater. And so 
you can mince your garlic obviously by hand, you know, just like chop it. Um, one way that we do it, if you are gonna do it on the cutting board. So if you take your knife, there's the flat side of it. And basically if my hand is the cutting board and you're gonna place the knife on top of the garlic like this, and then very carefully just kind of push it down. And what that does is smashes the garlic and then you can, it's much easier to kind of like, because it's nice and flat and already a little bit smashed for you, you can go ahead and uh, mince it. Uh, the other way to do it is to use this. Again, one of my favorite tools because it's super easy. Um, so we're gonna grate some garlic into this bowl and garlic is just one of those ingredients that Koreans cannot live without. <laughs> it is absolutely pretty much in all of our cuisine. Um, and then after we do this, we're gonna get roughly about like two tablespoons. But again, this is very much um, one of those recipes that like every mom has their own kind of twists. Some moms really like to use like a lot of garlic. Some moms kind of pull back on the garlic. So um, this is our recipe. This is what we like. Um, but depending on how much you like garlic, you can obviously up or down uh, it. So we have our garlic in there and I'll show you why I like it. So if you can see that texture right there, it's like almost like perfect um, in terms of going into a sauce. Sorry, the glare. There we go. <laughs> Alrighty. Then we're gonna go in with some soy sauce. So we're gonna do, I believe it's two tablespoons. Can you just, uh... ah, three and a half. So one, two, three and a half. There we go. And we're gonna go in with three tablespoons of white sugar. And we have some sesame oil. And again, um, as Caleb was explaining before about the oil, sesame oil is like a very flavorful oil. And that's the flavor that we want um, to taste in this chop chip. So that's also another reason why we used um, a neutral oil. And then we're gonna go in with some sesame seeds. So you can see it pre-mixed right here, everything all together, I think. Angles are hard. <laughs> all righty, perfect. So you're just gonna uh, mix it all together. And all you're looking for here is that the sugar is dissolving. Um, you don't have to have it perfectly dissolved again because you are using the heat. The heat is, um, from the noodles and the vegetables is gonna be enough for it to kind of like melt all the way through. But you just want to mix it just so it's nice and incorporated. So this, if you guys can see, that is what you are looking for. I'll just go to you. <laughs> Can you guys see it now? There you go. So that's what you're looking for. Uh, quick question about the sesame oil. Do you all use refined or unrefined sesame oil? So refined sesame oil, uh, you can find that at, I've seen it at um, sort of the like organic uh, stores or I've even seen it at a, our lo local grocery stores. And the difference uh, of that is they filter a lot. So a lot of the flavor of the sesame oil is um, taken away. Um, so short answer is no, we use uh, unrefined because the flavor is there. Um, and so yeah, we don't, we would uh, recommend not using the refined one because I believe they use that as an alternative for um, like a cooking oil. And um, for sesame oil, um, at least in this application, since we're not cooking it, um, we want to have the flavor of it. Yeah. So all. Um, oh yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Just a couple of other questions um, on this dish. So about the uh, the spinach, can you talk about why it was sautéed if you were, or why it was blanched if you're also going to sauté it? Yeah. So it's like one of those Korean mom things. <laughs> Uh, and so um, the when you just saute it, um, a lot of, so I'm sure everyone's experienced this where you get like this gigantic packet of spinach and then it turns into this. And a lot of the reason why is because spinach has a ton of water content. 
Um, one thing that we like to do is to blanch it first and then saute it because then we can kind of like wilt it down really fast without having it burn in the pan. That's like a big thing that you can do when you do saute it is that if your heat is too high or anything, it's kind of like a fail safe. And so we blanch it, we squeeze out as much water as we possibly can. So it's already kind of like not, um, doesn't have a ton of water content. And then you're just kind of loosening it up and getting a little bit more flavor um, because the flavor of something that's blanched is definitely going to be different than something that's also sauteed. So it's like a cooking fail safe as well as kind of adding a flavor. Yeah, that is an amazing tip that I feel like I will now use in lots of additional cooking. So thank you for sharing. And what a great question, audience. Um, yeah, so I am just going to plate it as, if you guys have more questions for this, but this is the final dish. Um, super colorful. We got all the vegetables going. Like we said, these are the types of vegetables that we like to eat um, in our top tip, but as it means mixed vegetable, you can really use it as like a kitchen sink kind of a um, dish meal. <laughs> I've got a couple of broader questions that we're going to save for the end, but one other sort of technique question for this one is um, when you are using the zester or the rasp for the garlic, how do you avoid from uh, grating your fingers off during that process? We like to say, if it gets scary, just stop. Um, there's like another infamous uh, kitchen tool called the mandolin. <laughs> if anyone has had experience with that, it's just this like long thing. It has like a very sharp blade in it and it's very easy for you to like you know cut uh vegetables into like large slices very quickly but it's also something that has claimed a lot of our chef fingers um so it really is one of the, those things where it's just it's not worth it right um you can always i'm sure you're going to use garlic and something else just take however much you get down to and then you it gets scary just stop and then just go onto the next globe and save the rest of that garlic for something else. It's just not worth it, <laughs> honestly. Totally makes sense. Thank you. Of course. Um, so yeah, so this is the final product. Beautiful, beautiful, all of the colors. Um, we got our uh, bell pepper, we got our um, sesame seeds right on top and all of those delicious sweet potato meals. Um, and I think I might have interrupted Caleb while he was sprinkling. So could you tell us what, what you sprinkled on right at the end? Yeah, so um, in the sauce, Roran put some uh, Roran put some uh, sesame seeds in, um, and we're just gonna show it to you guys. Look how beautiful Yay! it is! <laughs> um, so I just sprinkled on top a little bit of more sesame seeds just to make it look it just looks nicer that way. <laughs> I'm just gonna hold this right here to distract from our resetting on our next. <laughs> plate or our next next dish um, well it's an excellent distraction your feed the feedback from the comments right now talking about how delicious this is and thanking you all for for demonstrating and demystifying this dish which is a restaurant favorite of theirs that they have been nervous to try at home so yeah. um what a great choice awesome right. if you could find the noodles it's only like a couple minutes away from being in your mouth <laughs> it really is I love that world. So, um, yeah, and then honestly, um, if you are using, like, uh, if you can't find it locally, we have found that we had a high success finding it online. Um, so using, you know, some, some online store, whatever um, you guys like to use, we recommend using that because we've found ingredients that we weren't able to find um, online, and, you know, the world is... Um, so amazing and <laughs> technology is great. So we were able to find things like the sweet potato noodles. If you guys have a hankering and have trouble finding it. Yeah. Um, so we're going to move on to our next dish. Um, uh, so this is called Koguma Matang and it is a caramelized sweet potato, um, sort of like a snack candy, could be a dessert sort of thing. Um, so I just want to give a disclaimer and a warning in the very beginning. You're going to be using um, a fryer uh, or like hot oil, and you're also going to be using hot um, sugar. And those things are just on the more dangerous side. Um, so please uh, use caution if you're going to try to do this. And um, we're going to try to make it um, as 
thoughtful as possible for you guys to follow us. Um, but we just wanted to give you a warning that there are um, extremely hot things to be aware of. Um, so please work with intention and uh, try not to burn yourselves and just uh, be very focused when you're making this dish because um, any distraction can lead to um, something unfortunate. So please do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so back to our start ingredient, the sweet potato. So we are gonna start off with that. Um, we did pre-fry it, but I'm gonna kind of talk you through the steps. So you want to, you do want to peel off the um, purple skin. And so I just want to show you that like beautiful cream color that I was talking about before. It's so not a perfect peel, but I just want to show it to you. So like super beautiful, amazing. Um, I think in some grocery stores that you can you can find that it's like a not like an Asian specialty store. I do believe that these are called like um, golden. It's like something golden, um, like golden fleshed or something like that. Um, but you can definitely find these in like your local retailer. Um, store as well. So basically what you're going to do when you have your sweet potato and they're going to be like all shapes and sizes. There's no shape that's better than the other. Um, but if you are not super confident with your knife skills, I do recommend that you find a potato that's kind of like this shape um, just because it makes the cutting of it a little bit easier. So what we're going to go ahead and do is that we are basically looking for small cube sizes like this Let's see if the glare works so it doesn't have to be perfect again this is one of those like mom dishes so you really are not looking for like a chef perfect cut or anything like that you're just looking for something that is like very uniform and um what that does kind of to my point earlier is that you just want everything to be a very similar size so that it will cook at the same time so yeah so that's just like what you're going for um so we have actually done the frying beforehand and just i want to just kind of talk you guys through this a little bit so if this is the pan that you are using the size of your pan oh, well, black on black great um you're gonna only be doing a shallow fry so this is not a deep fry um by any means so hopefully that'll uh, alleviate some people's like fears about this um, so you're only really using just enough oil to cover the one little sweet potato. Um, so that's just about probably like an inch of oil, maybe a little bit more. Um, but again, this is just any kind of neutral frying oil. Um, we really like canola oil for frying. So you can easily get that at your grocery store. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to heat it up. Make sure you have a thermometer on you. You're going to get it up to 350. Another little chef trick while you are um, doing anything related to frying at home, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get your um, uh, oil up to about 350, but right before you put in your um, whatever ingredient that you are frying here, we are frying the sweet potato, you're gonna actually bump up your heat just a touch because if you have your temperature right at 350 and you're adding on a room temperature or a cold ingredient, it's immediately gonna drop that temperature. So one way that we kind of mitigate that um, in the kitchen um, as chefs is that we bump up the temperature so there's just a quick blast of heat to kind of counteract the room temperature and the cold. And then we pull it down um, back into like a more like a medium, medium low, just to maintain that 350 degree uh, Fahrenheit temperature. But it's just kind of a good way so that you're not losing all of this heat all of a sudden by adding in the ingredients that you're actually trying to fry and then like struggling to kind of get back up there. So it's just a way to kind of beat it to the punch. So that's what we did. And basically what you are looking for is this. So nice and golden and um, it's gonna be kind of like hard, which is good. You want that like crunchy exterior, but on the inside it's nice and pillowy and soft and cooked. So usually this takes about <clears throat> like six to eight minutes. Um, you can always test it by just taking one out putting it on your resting rack, give it a couple seconds, because again, it's gonna be really hot. Just poke a fork through it and just like, if the outside layer is like a little bit difficult, that's okay, because again, we're going for crunchy, but the inside should be nice and soft. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for. And then you're gonna pull it out, let it rest and do that. And now we're gonna go on to the hot sugar part. So go ahead and heat up your pan. 
And I will say uh, caramel is one of those things that uh, chefs even have like a hard time with. It's only it's just because it's one of those things where you can't really taste it while you're you're going. This is absolutely um, something that is like a visual and um, visual and like smell oriented cooking technique. So you are really trying to again when Caleb said focus, like this is a place where you really want to focus. You really, really, really want to focus because you are looking for specific colors. Um, because if it gets too dark, then it's going to taste really burnt, and like, that's not necessarily like the nice, sweet, delicious um, kind of flavor that we're going for. But sugar moves very fast, so it's kind of like a accelerating car, so to speak. So um, if you're going downhill and you're accelerating, it's just like going faster and faster and faster. As soon as sugar kind of catches heat, it'll just keep going, rolling in a certain direction. So this is where you're going to really try to watch your heat um, and just be careful with it again, because you can't like obviously dip your finger in there and taste and be like, hmm, is that better? I've tried that. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Terrible idea. It smells really good. But yeah. <laughs> don't be tempted to do it. Yeah. it's Your fingers will thank you. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're just going to avoid all of those things. Again, this is not to scare you. This is just to, it really is not that difficult. You will see it like when I start going. Um, but it's just to kind of give you a fair understanding just so you can kind of manage your expectation. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with um, the syrup. So again, this syrup is actually optional. Um, almost the majority of like moms will use just like regular sh like table sugar. Um, totally fine to do that. Um, we just like to kind of step it up a, uh, up a notch. So we use something called uh, chuchong. And if you can see it right here, it's like a syrup. And it is a rice-based rice based syrup that uh, has a little bit of, it's malted just ever so slightly, um, like way, way, way back um, in like the old Korean like dynasty times. This is actually what people use to sweeten things because rice was in abundance. White sugar, like sugar cane was not necessarily something that was like super accessible at the time. And so this is um, an ingredient that was very commonly used to sweeten anything savory as well as anything sweet. Um, so it's just some, one of those, uh, it's, it's also less sweet um, than like your regular old like white sugar. So, but it also provides like a really nice texture. So that's why, and flavor. So that's why we like to use it here. But again, there's no shame in using just like the plain white sugar. If anything, the majority of like people will use that. So anyways, so we're going in again with the syrup. And I've heated my pan just on like low. Again, I'm trying to be very, very careful um, with my heat. And then we have our just white table sugar right here. And then I'm going to go ahead and put it in. And basically what I'm trying to do is I am trying to spread it out somewhat evenly. So you can see it right there. And what this does is that it prevents like one part it prevents one part of the sugar to get more hot than the other. And so I'm just trying to get every single granule of sugar to just have this like even, um, what's it called? Uh, like chance at getting heat. So you can start to see it's starting to bubble a little bit. Oh yeah, shouldn't burn my shirt. <laughs> um, it's starting to bubble a little bit, which is good. It's starting to get just a touch of caramel color which is also good. That's what we want. And it's just starting to melt. So once it gets a little bit more melty, I'll show you. And before this, um, if you see in the recipe, it asks you to add a little bit of the hot oil onto into the pan. And that's just to help the sugar from sticking to itself. And sometimes that uh, causes uh, crystallization and it'll just make the sugar um, it will have a harder time becoming a caramel. Uh, so, you know, just use a touch of that oil and um, it's just gonna help with that caramelization process. Yeah. So as you can see, now it's gotten pretty melty, which is good. So kind of all like the granules that we normally saw um, have been going away. So now I've turned down the heat and as you can see, I'm really trying to watch the heat because even in that, split second that I showed you it was like kind of white and now it's getting to that caramel color so here maybe I could do this 
if you can see that. It's definitely a darker color. So this is when you're gonna go in with your sweet potatoes. So I'm gonna drop these guys in, and all you're looking to do is just coat them. So you're not cooking it, because again, it's already cooked. And let's see if I can show you while I do this. Yeah, so you're doing that. I don't recommend flipping the pan, uh, doing any fancy chef moves. Um, again, this is hot caramel. You do not want to get it on your skin because it will just stick. So if you can see, it's already getting kind of like sticky and you can see kind of those caramel like lines. <laughs> so super awesome. That's what you are looking for. And you are just looking to coat each and every single one with the caramel. And it looks like we are just about there and then just put it out onto a sheet and get all that caramel goodness right on top. So while the caramel is hot, you want to be able to, they're, they're, it's gonna to want to start sticking to itself. Um, so you wanna quickly um, separate it out so that the caramel doesn't stick all the pieces together. Um, so just as it is hot, you, um, you wanna separate each piece of the caramel because it will set very fast. Yeah. Um, and then um, we set this uh, sheet tray with some uh, parchment paper. And um, as a little added insurance, we added a little oil to the bottom of it just so it doesn't stick to the parchment paper. Because the worst thing in the world is making something <laughs> delicious and then finding it <laughs> stuck to some paper because paper is not very good to eat. <laughs> um, so we're at this point where it has cooled down and there's no more fighting for me. Uh, there's a couple of pieces that stuck together, but That's there's okay. nothing that I can do about that. Um, and it is just set and caramelized, but we're gonna let give it a quick chance to cool mm -hmm. before we start plating. Yeah, and then while it's still warm, you're gonna go in with a little bit of salt again, just to um, season it just a little bit. And then you are also going to go in with some black sesame seeds. Um, black sesame seeds is just like a really uh, traditional garnish for this. It kind of uh, gives it a pop of color. All right, so we have our plate right here. So I would just do a really quick test, just see if it's like it's too hot to handle. It's actually really great right now. So we can go in, just plate a couple of these guys. And if you hear, you could hear how crispy and yeah. crunchy it is. So super delicious. And then we can just finish it off with a little bit of a thing. And then I'll go over to you guys. <laughs> and these are the little babies. <laughs> there we go. Oh my goodness, this looks so delicious. Um, so a few questions for you all about this. Um, one, do you ever use honey or maple or agave syrup instead of the uh, jochong? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, we use a combination of it. Um, so when it's, it is uh, more difficult to make caramel um, from something that is more on the liquidy side and also with honey honey is a pretty strong flavor um, so if you wanted to add a little honey for the flavor we'd recommend doing that in place of the jocho um, if you really like the taste of honey um, I, I really like it i would consider doing that for sure um, maple syrup sounds delicious too um, but i wouldn't recommend subbing the um, syrup or the honey for all of the sugar in the recipe mm -hmm. As far as um, a non-stick alternative like the parchment paper, um, there were two suggestions or questions in the chat of a Silpat mat or non-stick Reynolds wrap. Uh, yeah, uh, anything that's non-stick. So Silpat, well, we don't have that at home, um, but we have parchment paper. Uh, we, we love Silpat, so go for it. Amazing. Um, so we also have a couple of more general questions about Korean American cooking that I saved till the end for a little bit more of a discussion. Brian, I am so jealous that you get to, to pop one of those in your mouth right now. That looked delicious. Um, okay, so somebody is saying that the last time they had Korean food, they really loved the balance of bitter kimchi with the sweetness of the rice. Can you talk a little bit about that flavor profile and how that shows up in Korean and Korean and American cooking? 
yeah um i think korean food is just as complex or as um unique and diverse as any other cuisine that you know um if it's your own background you could take a take sort of a, a perspective on your own um cuisine and your culture and just apply that to korean food it's so diverse there's so many things going on there's a bunch of history and there's also a lot of innovation happening right now um i would say just to generalize in a way korean food's all about uh pretty aggressive flavors um and that is a generalization because there are definitely instances where that's not the case um but just the food that we um we were just at like a korean barbecue restaurant yesterday um very on brand for us uh, we mm -hmm. go all the time and the flavors are just very intense um uh if you think of like gochujang gochujang spicy it's a little sweet um there's it's kind of savory um and then when you have kimchi it's very sour and um has like some spice and heat to it um and we just we think that it's so awesome um Korean food is just so has so many different flavors and i think if you have not had korean food before because there's so many different flavor profiles things i have uh no doubt that you'll be able to find something that you really like that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so somebody in our audience says they've been studying vegan Korean cooking. Both of these recipes are vegan. Is that the kind of cooking you did at your restaurant and are a lot of Koreans or Korean Americans vegan? I would say, so the first part is, um, you know, vegan Korean food is, um, a lot of Korean food is actually vegan based on it's not like a intentional sort of thing, but it's sort of out of necessity. Um, you know, even maybe not even uh, 50 or 60 years ago, um, maybe even more recently than that, Korea has uh, been more of on a poorer side of the country. If you look at Korea now, you would say like, that's crazy, how could you think that? But you know, um, my parents, when they were living in Korea, they experienced a Korea that it was coming out of a war and um, occupation by other countries and just a, a history of um, being more of an impoverished country. And because of that, um, you didn't have a lot of access to um, quote unquote luxury ingredients like meat or um, things like that. So they would use things of the land. And uh, coincidentally, a lot of that stuff is vegan. Um, and through innovation and, um, you know, survival, we're able to make delicious ingredients based on like fermentation and, um, you know, making pickles and kimchi and preservation. And a lot of that stuff ended up being uh, vegan. And a lot of the stuff that isn't um, necessarily uh, vegan can be made vegan. Um, in our restaurant, uh, we are very conscious of our choices of making uh vegan options available because um but with korean uh cuisine it's very accessible we were able to make a lot of delicious um foods some of our favorite uh, dishes that we had at the restaurant were you know incidentally vegan but we were just making it because we wanted to have delicious food yeah nice. i love the idea of incidentally vegan what a, <laughs> what a great phrase Sorry, go ahead, Ryan. It's just a quick piggyback is that um, along the lines of what Kayla was talking about, the history is that um, right now, I feel like it's, and for the past like maybe five ish years, this Korean cuisine kind of has like had its um, popularization, I guess, like around the world. One of the biggest things that has been really popular about Korean cuisine is the Korean barbecue. But it's like, for people who are in Korea, it's a little bit like interesting that that is what like Korean people are known for is because the actual geography of Korea is very like mountainous. So like almost like half the regions or the provinces um, are named after the local uh, mountain. Um, and because of that, raising cattle, raising pigs is not e quite the easiest when you are surrounded by mountainous areas. Um, so 
there's like a joke that it's like a lot of Korean cuisine is like roots and shoots and stuff. And because that's the truth, like we eat a ton of roots, we eat a lot of vegetables because that's what grows on mountainous areas and like in the valleys and stuff. And so um, again, incidentally vegan, incidentally vegetarian. Thank you so much for sharing that um, historical and cultural perspective. I think that's really fascinating. Somebody is wondering, any update or previews on what's next for Magpie and the Tiger for the two of you after this current pop-up ends? Yeah, so um, <laughs> we are, um, we updated our website to reflect um, sort of what we're doing right now. Um, we're currently um, foregoing searching for another brick and mortar. Uh, because we are doing a pop-up that is exploring sort of a different aspect of our uh, cooking, um, we are using the opportunity from for now to um, partner with uh, people like Please Bring Chips is where we are doing our pop-up. They are doing month-long chef series with local chefs that, um, and we are currently in residence with them. Um, and we are doing, we are available for private parties and private dinners. Um, so we have a couple of those on our books. Um, if anybody is interested in having us, you know, cook a delicious dinner for any sort of occasion, uh, we are available for that. Um, and you could find a lot of that information on our website at magpieandthetiger.com. Um, and we are also um, thinking about teaching more classes. So, you know, this is a virtual class that we're doing. Um, but we want to do in-person classes where um, you'd be able to actually cook the food yourself and we can be there um, to teach you as well. Um, and I think finally we have a couple of things that like we are um, formulating uh, Christmas or holiday, I would say more holiday, uh, a gift set. Um, it will be announced on our social media and our um, and on our website so keep an eye out for that because um, we're trying to make or we're going to make a package of um of our chili crunch and uh our kimchi and sort of um making something that you can uh have as a gift so keep an eye out for those things uh so we're gonna do one final question and uh could you tell us a little bit about where the name magpie and the tiger comes from yeah, uh, Magpie and the Tiger. Um, so that paint comes from a um, painting uh, theme or a motif that um, is in a lot of folk painting in Korean uh, history. Um, so the magpie is a representation of the Korean uh, person, like the regular person. Um, and it is sort of the uh, person personification of the the Korean common folk um, and they're very shrewd and um, kind of, uh, pragmatic and wise in their own ways um, very cunning and that was a way to describe like how um, the common folk are, were at, in that time and painters would like to paint that to represent the people and the tiger is um, a representation it is the um, national like guardian of the of the Korean Peninsula um, but it's also uh, seen as like a representation of royalty and if you were to look at the paintings back then you would see that the tiger is painted in a way where it has like crazy eyes as a feature and that was a play on the just sort of satirizing um, royalty in a way, you know, using crazy eyes or like um, features that are exaggerated to sort of just like play a joke on the, the royalty. And um, I think for us, when we were starting the restaurant, we wanted to have something that um, represented like our culture and things that we were trying to explore. And that kind of tiger is something that, um, sort of rang, uh, sort of resonated with us while we were um, making the restaurant. And sometimes we see ourselves as the crazy tiger or like the wise magpie in uh, various instances. So, um, some, you know, as, as we've been working on this restaurant, we 
kind of see ourselves in those um, two animals. Yeah, and like, and just to um, add on, it's that it's this. Uh, I think a lot of people who are hyphenated Americans can uh, relate to this, which is that there's just a constant tension, and that's like a big piece of what this motif is about. It's this tension that there is there is a relationship between the royalty or the tiger and the magpie. Um, but you're kind of, it's, it's always like, it's a very playful scene. Um, it can be confusing. It can be intense. It can be kind of all these different kind of like emotions and relationships. And like, I feel like that's a big part of the Korean American or high community American um, experience where, you know, we kind of don't have a place to go to a degree. Um, meaning, if we go to Korea, because we are Korean American, people know instantly, even though we look like this, they know instantly that we are from the States. Um, and we were, we would never be seen as like a Korean Korean. Um, whereas in America, because we look like this, a lot of the times we are seen not as like fully American. Um, so there's this kind of thing that we have to deal with a lot in our lives being Korean American, where we are both and, either or sometimes, um, and it's just this like constant tension that we have that also kind of translates into our food. Again, it's not just Korean, it's not, you're not just getting, you're sitting down with a bunch of panchan and like that. We can do that, um, but we also have that American side of us as well. And so um, it's really about like kind of playing around with this tension about, like I said at the beginning, like what even is Korean American cuisine? Great question, let's just explore it. And um, it's a lot about cooking our experiences um, as much as we are just cooking things that like we know from our um, parents and, and like our heritage. What an amazing answer. Thank you both so much for sharing. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation.